Hey everybody, welcome to the GMG Review. Today I'm taking a look at indie game Forbidden Song from uh, KRD Designs. This little small print, uh, it almost looks like, uh, I don't know, like a metal mag. It's been done in, uh, I guess it's five and a half by eight. Uh, like print style, as like a small book, is uh, a open license Morkborg, Merkborg, Mork, Morkborg, I think it's pronounced Merk. Um, tabletop miniature game uh, for one or more player and it's designed basically with the idea of hobbying building your own miniatures and kind of that 28 inspired um, artsy sort of wargaming experience in mind. It's D20 based uh, and it jumps right into character design which I absolutely love allowing you to either create your own characters or randomly generate them and then convert them yourselves. Um, so let's dive in. Now this it, print version is not necessarily available right now. I know that the designer is looking um, to try and get it back in print in various areas and stuff, but it is available uh, digitally. I'll, I'll link it below so you can check it out through Drive-Thru RPG right now. So you can check it out. Um, so let's jump in and look at the print version and this should be back so if you're patient, you can probably get a copy of it as well. This is the full color cover, Miniature Gaming at the End of the World. Uh, and then contents. Now, it, if you were expecting a standard print or like wargaming book, you're not going to get that here. It's done in this lovely kind of, I almost call this like a 90s punk design. This looks like an, either a Vertigo comic or a 90s sort of like uh, punk magazine design. Um, and the basic MacGuffin for this is the mad wizard hides in his castle, only appearing to those willing to undertake his bidding. And that is exactly what's happening here. Um, you are uh, basically a bunch of sort of random adventurers in a rotting, destroyed fantasy world of Merkborg, um, if you're familiar with the RPG, and you're just taking missions from a crazy old wizard. Uh, <laughs> so this is this is his thing. Rifrix the Mad Wizard. He bids the desperate, brave, and foolish to venture into the ruins of Kyrgyz, uh, sort of like a fallen like um, settlement. He seeks the forbidden psalm, a nameless scripture Vriprix claims uh, can stop the darkness. Whether this is the truth of the Mad Wizard, um, um, ramblings or not, his coffers run deep, promised riches await the strong, quick or cowardly enough to survive, bearing back treasures from the lost ages. And in these bleak times, good coin is hard to come by. So, Forbidden Psalm is a 28 mil uh, min uh, 28 millimeter miniature agnostic game. You can use any miniatures you already own or build custom minis for the game. Grab some dice, some miniatures, a tape measure, a 2x2 two two foot table, and you're ready to play. So, measurements are in inches. Sorry, metric heathens. You can convert a 1 inch to 2.5 centimeters, and you can pre-measure. Um, it is all written in this conversational style. So, again, this is an indie game. Get ready for that. Uh, dice rolls, abbreviated DR, are um, determining the outcome of your actions. And everything is going to be um, a DR12 for the most part. You're trying to hit a target number of 12 with all your dice rolls, you're adding or subtracting whatever your stat is, if it's good or bad. Uh, and then modifiers, stats, feats, and flaws can all modify things, and modifiers all stack. Uh, and then it jumps right in. Now, this is this is a writer after my own heart. Um, they jump right in with creating a warband. It's the first thing you do. So you've got, here you got your basic premise of the game, some like, what is this game? And then start making models. And that really does drive the core of this game. This is not a complicated game. It's not a, a, an incredibly like detailed rule set as far as um, crunch, but there is tons of options and tons of procedural generation. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna take my miniatures that I already have ready for this. You always use five models in a warband. And we're going to follow along. Uh, I copied the very nice um, finished roster sheet that came with the book. Uh, and I grabbed all of my models that I made for uh, Realm Quest. Because this is the 28 inspired um, type of game. I figured I would use some 28 inspired like converted miniatures. And so what have I got? I got an elf, a dwarf, a human, um, barbarian, and then two big knightly stormcast. One's like a wizard and one's a, a fighter, a paladin. And I'm just going to start making rules for them. Uh, and I'm just going to do that. So this is the... Warband, we're going to call them the Lost, because they are lost in Kyrgyz. Uh, and then we're going to roll up a name. So this we'll start with my hero. This is the Paladin here with his uh, shield and hammer. And it's a D100 table. So I'm going to grab 2D10 and roll to see what they are. So 56, his first name is Eisenkush. Cool. Eisenkush. And we'll re-roll any doubles, obviously. And then his surname title is Six, the Neither. Eisenkush the Neither. I like it. Uh, we'll do his big wizardy friend. 
His first name from the Book of Names is 29, which is Gorand. And then his title, 62, The Last Fated. I love this procedural generation. Uh, then we've got, we'll go with the Barbarian. So the Barbarian, who is following them around. 21, not applicable, doesn't have a first name. I like that. 2186, he's just the fast. That's all, his, that's all he's called. Maybe he doesn't speak, maybe his tongue's cut out. I'm gonna say his tongue's cut out. Uh, and then, so he doesn't have a first name, he's just the fast. Uh, the elf, first name, 88. Uh, what's an elfy name? Rain, that's a pretty elfy, artsy name. And then his title is Nine, the smoothest. <laughs> Rain the smoothest. That's the most elfy name ever. I love this. Smoothest. Uh, and then the dwarf, 51. Risen, or Risen maybe. Uh, and then his title, 98. The evil beats. <laughs> Risen, the evil beats. He's, he's going to the beat laboratory to build some beats. <laughs> All right. So I got, I've named my war band now. This is incredibly entertaining. Now, if I wanted to, I could, in this process, there is an optional rule at the very end, roll to see what everyone's armed with. There is an actual, like, roll to see what people are and then make weird and wonderful war bands. I'm not gonna do this, obviously, because I'm using existing models. So create a war band. Now I have to assign stats. To generate each of your model stats, take one of the following stat lanes. Plus three, plus one, zero, or minus three, or plus two, plus two, minus one, minus two, and assign to each model across agility, presence, strength, and toughness. Now everything you do in the game is assigned to one of these four stats. Um, your health is gonna be equal to your eight plus your toughness, and your toughness could be a negative number. Um, and then that's it, and your hit points regenerate between counters. So you're basically taking the pool system of like D&D stat application and applying it here. And these are all just modifiers to your dice rolls. So if I want to do something, again, target number 12, I need a nine plus if I was plus three to it. I need a 10 plus, right? So I'm looking at better than 50-50. So what you're basically doing is deciding what someone's big flaw is and what someone's big strength is. So I feel like I'll start with my leader. I'll start with Eisenkush the Neither. And I think I'm going to use this one. So he is uh, going to be big, tough, and slow. So we're going to give him toughness plus three. Uh, we'll do plus one to his strength because he's pretty strong. And then we'll do uh, zero to his presence. So like his leadership and stuff is like will. And then minus three to his agility. So he's, he's not fast. He's a big, tanky dude. And that's how you basically build your stat lines for these guys. I will go with Goran the Last Faded, and he can be my, my wizard, which I have to actually pay for to get him scrolls and stuff. Uh, we'll use the other stat line for him, I think, and do the plus two, plus two, minus one, minus two. And we'll go plus two to his presence, plus two to his toughness, because he's still big and strong and armored and stuff. And then we'll go minus one to his strength and minus two to his agility. Because he's old, right? He's a big old wizard man. Uh, the Fast, my barbarian, oh. Okay, so I feel like, I mean, he's the fast. He's all about hitting. Uh, I think we go plus two agility, plus two strength, and then minus one toughness, minus two presence. So he's fast, but he's not smart, maybe. Or minus two toughness. No, or we could do plus three, plus one. We could do plus three agility, or plus three strength, plus one agility. Yeah, we'll do plus three strength, plus one ability. Plus three strength, plus one, he's a fast hitter. And then zero to his presence, or minus three to his presence maybe, because he can't speak, and then zero to his toughness. There we go, using that stat line. So you can see, even though I'm using the same pool, it'll change up how my stats are applied, and that's basically what you're trying to decide is, how does this guy look, what are you making him do? So he's not, not tough, I mean, he's a big beefy dude, but he's not wearing any armor. Um, and then he's strong, fast, and his presence is um, the thing that he's lacking, because he can't talk, because his tongue was cut out. Rain the smoothest, uh, he's an elf. But he's also an elf fighter, uh, so I feel like plus two, plus two, minus one, minus two. We'll do minus two toughness, he's an elf. Uh, plus two strength, plus two agility, or plus two presence, plus two agility. Maybe minus one to his strength, because he's not super strong, but we'll give him a nice big sword. So we'll do minus one to his strength, and then plus two to his presence, and plus two to his agility. 
And then the dwarf, obviously tough and stuff, but he's also a shooter. He's my one with a big gun and a hammer. So I feel like maybe the plus two line as well. We'll give him plus two agility because he's pretty good at shooting. Plus two toughness because he's a dwarf. And then minus one strength and minus two presence because he's just a jerk. <laughs> he's a dwarf. He's risen the evil beats. He's going to give you the evil beats. So there's uh, building our stat line. So our stats for our party are made now. And I already wrote down what I wanted for my armor and stuff. But now everybody needs to be assigned a flaw and a strength. And they're all random. So we got to roll for it to see what they are. It's all d20s for flaws. So everybody has a flaw and everybody has a feat. So my flaw for, and we'll start again with Eisenkush. His flaw is four. He's got a putrid smell. All models within three inches of him suffer minus one of presence. <laughs> he smells terrible. Putrid smell. I guess maybe that's the flames. Uh, maybe just the burning of his torch. Uh, within three inches. And then his feet is going to be d20, 10. He's tough as nails, plus two hit points, minus one agility. So his agility is minus four now, but he's plus two hit points. Oh, I should fill in everybody's everybody hit points. So he's tough as nails. Well, that fit. Uh, so he's minus four agility now, but he's plus five hit points, so he has 13 hit points. Uh, his is, Garand is 10, because it's plus two. It's just eight for the fast, because he's zero. Uh, six for the elf, and then eight for the dwarf. All right, so Garand the faded, his flaw, the, the least faded, is nine. Uh, scared of heights, can't climb or jump. Well, he is old. <laughs> Flaws, scared of heights. You stay on the ground floor. Uh, and then his feet is 15. He is a medic, can make a presence test to heal a down model. It's restored to one hit points and returns to fight. Cool, he's a healer. That's cool for my healer guy. All right, the fast. What is your terrible flaw? Your flaw is a three. Brittle bones, plus one damage, one hit. All right, well, he's fast. And then his feet is 19. Charge, model can move twice its movement value, but uh, must end with an inch of the model. That's, I mean, that's perfect, he's the fast. I'm, I'm, I'm doing this. I'm not trying to do this. It's just happening. <laughs> so you can don't move within one inch of model of enemy. I, I love how procedural stuff tells a story like this. All right, Rain the Smoothest, the elf. His flaw is three brittle bones. That makes sense. He's an elf. And then his feet, he's an elf, what's his feet? 16, he's an imp improvised fighter. Model can make a uh, makeshift one-handed weapon when out in the field. Model can make a makeshift, oh, so he can just make himself a weapon if he needs it. Mm, improvised fighter. So if like his weapon breaks, or he's disarmed somehow, he can just make a weapon. Cool, he's an elf. All right, the dwarf, what's his flaw? His flaw is 11, vacant mind, uncaring of the real world. They never collect treasure or items. He's just, he's single-mindedly, all he does is kill. The evil beats, he's just listening to the evil beats. So he never collects treasure. Can't collect items. A dwarf that doesn't love gold, weird. And then his feet is? Three, cowardly, model gets minus one to all morale tests, but plus one agility. <laughs> Maybe it's just his, like, the, the evil beats in his head. Uh, that's a feat is cowardly, interesting. 
So he's minus one morale, but plus one agility. It's because he puts the puts the beats helmet on and becomes agility three. Well, there we go. And that's it. So we've, we've got our feats and our flaws now, and we have to buy item and equipment. So you have 50 gold to buy stuff when you begin with. Models have five equipment slots plus their strength. So for instance, uh, he'll have six equipment slots. So I'm just going to put a six here. Uh, he's strength minus one, so Garand has four equipment slots. And you need to pick things up with equipment slots too. The fast is plus three strength, so he's got seven equipment slots. He's carrying stuff. Uh, Rain the Smoothest has four equipment slots. And then Risen is strength minus one, so he's got four as well. All right, so let's start with uh, Eisenkirsch the Neither. He's got a hammer and, no, he's got a, sh a hammer, shield, and light armor, because obviously he's super armored. So that's gonna cost him eight. Uh, and use three of his equipment slots. It'll say how much armor it takes. It takes one. Yeah, okay. Because I can't afford to get everybody heavy armor, even though it looks like they're wearing heavy armor. I'm just buying them something. Uh, the only guy who's not getting any armor is uh, the fast. The fast won't have any because he's got. He's not wearing anything. Um, so he's got uh, light armor. Basically, so that's going to cost me eight. So uh, equipment, light armor. He has one armor value, so he'll reduce damage by one armor. And then he has a hammer. So light armor, hammer, and shield. And shields can be destroyed too. Uh, but shields are can be destroyed to ignore one attack after all rolls. So basically, if I'm going to die, I spend my shield to get rid of it. Uh, I have one armor base for my light armor. And then my hammer is a warhammer. It's D6 damage, one D6 damage, and has the ability of ca criticals cause daze. Crit causes dazed. So it'll daze the opponent, and that means uh, must make a presence has to activate on a failure. The model can only move on a success. They're not dazed anymore. So you have to shake off the daze condition. Uh, then we'll go with Garand the Less Fated. Uh, he's going to be a wizard, so it costs me five gold to make him a spellcaster, and then he rolls for two scrolls. Uh, and then he's got a glaive, which is eight, and light armor, which is two. So that's going to put me at another 15. So I'm at 23 so far of my 50. So he's got a glaive, because that's what he's armed with, or modeled with. And the glaive is reach, so it's a two-inch uh, engagement, and they can't attack back. D8 damage, it's a strength test. Oh yeah, and you should note what, what it is. Uh, so it's strength. Uh, glaive is strength. And you're gonna wanna get like a D&D &D dice pack for this, because it uses all kinds of basically D&D &D dice. D8s, D6s, D12s, all kinds of stuff like that, D10s. Uh, and then it's reach, glaive is reach. Two inches. Uh, this coming has got light armor glaive. Glaive, and he's a caster. That doesn't take a slot. Uh, so caster, oh, I should have put him down here because he's my, war I can only have one caster, and he's over here. So I should actually, I'll copy all this over later. I'll just write his scroll stuff in here, and I'll copy it up. I just realized I messed it up. Your, your, your character sheet has a room for your caster right here, but I just did him in order instead. Uh, I did the dwarf over there by accident. Uh, and then the fast, he's got a, uh, I already did the math over here. A hammer and a sword, which is seven, so that's 30. The dwarf has a crossbow for eight, 10 for light armor, and hand axe for three, and that's uh, 43. And the elf has light armor and a two handed or a, um, what's it called? A Ulfbert sword, which a crit causes bleeding for five. And that puts me at 50 overall. So with all their equipment, it adds up to 50, but I do have to roll to see what my uh, scrolls are. So in creating a warband, you can select uh, one model to be a caster. Um, scroll and the scrolls do count towards equipment, sorry, which means that he can carry, actually he's maxed out. His two scrolls maxed out, which means he can't carry anything else. Uh, you can't use scrolls with shields or heavy armor. I don't have it. Models that find scrolls can use them for the spell casting rules. And all spells have a limited range of 12 inches. You get two random scrolls, one clean and one unclean, because there's unclean spells as well. Uh, so my clean scroll is going to be six. Uh, Shield of the Faithless. Models cannot be targeted by range attacks for one round. So I can, um, so my clean spell is Shield of the Faithless. 
of the Faithless. So cool, so I can protect everybody for one round, and then my unclean spell is a three, which is going to be invisible hands. Can move an object, drop treasure, or weapon d12 inches. Cool. So d12 inch move object. And then I got my stash down here. So I'll fill the rest of this off uh, without you guys having to watch and wait. <laughs> so, uh, but that's my, my warband's done. So that's the first thing in the book is build your warband. And it was super quick and easy. I based it on the models I liked and what they looked like. Um, and then like just was ready to, I'm ready to play basically. I have an army list. I have a, a warband built and, and, and ready to go. So play a game, pick a scenario. There's 10 in the book. Uh, set up the board, it's describing the scenario, determine conditions, uh, like if it's raining and stuff like that, there's lots of weather conditions, deploy your models, determine who goes first, by rolling a d20 and going highest. So each game round, determine initiative for that round, take it in turns to activate a single model, and then activate any monsters in the table on play, and then end the game round. So activate a model. Um, when you select a model activate, it can do a move and an action. Uh, each model gets a single activation per round. If a model wishes to move, it must move before it performs its action. Uh, if it had performed an action, its activation ends. So that is kind of worth noting. You can't do things in any order. I'm not, I don't know how I feel about that yet, but I haven't played the game. So I'm going to play the game and give it a try and we'll see how I feel. So what actions can you do? Make a ranged attack, make a melee attack, use a piece of equipment or a feat, use a scroll to cast a spell, and likely die. Uh, like that note. Pick up and or drop any number of items off the ground or dead or down models within an inch, and then interact with treasure or scenario items within an inch of you, and then make a second move as an action. So you can move twice. Uh, deployment, before the first round of the game, roll initiative to determine who places a model first, then alternate placing models in your deployment zones. Uh, D20 highest goes first for initiative. Making tests, all tests unless otherwise specified, need a 12 plus to pass, and that's D20, add your modifiers and get a 12. Um, example, uh, Nifilm the Hermit wants to jump a gap, he rolls a D20 plus his agility, which is a plus 3. He rolls a 10, uh, which adding to his plus 3 agility results in a 13, and it's enough to pass. He lands an inch of the enemy and hits him with a sword. On this test, he adds his strength, which is a minus three. He rolls a d20 and gets a 14. However, his minus three takes it to 11 and he fails to hit. Rolling a one before applying any modifiers is a failure. It's called a fumble. Rolling a 20 before any modifiers is a critical and always succeeds. Movement, you can move a number of inches equal to five plus your agility. So uh, that means that Eisenkush the neither moves an inch per turn. <laughs> You can move in any direction or combination of directions up to the maximum movement of the model. Train smaller than an inch can be moved over for free. He is so slow. Train over an inch must be climbed. Models have a climb speed of half inch or half their movement. Models can jump gaps three inches or less, but has to pass an agility to do so. On a failure, they take a damage per inch that they fall rounded down. On a fumble, they also get a new injury. Uh, models can move off a board edge or treat as survived and no longer participate in the scenario. Uh, Nifilm the Hermit has an agility of plus three. Uh, he has a movement of 8 inches. Nifilm the Hermit can make a jump, but rolls a 3 and fails to jump falling inches, taking 3 damage. But reduces 2 for armor for 1 damage, so anyway, your armor reduces any damage that you take. Combat, check range, uh, check stat modifiers for your weapon type, roll attacks, apply damage, if any hits are successful. So you perform a close combat attack, you pick your weapon, um, you must be within an inch to do so, and it's a DR12 test with your modifier. And if, uh, it is risky, however, and your opponent can always attack you back if you attack them, but they're minus three to their roll. So it's a simultaneous attack at minus three back. If both hit, just roll for damage for each one. This minus three is negated in close combat if another friendly model is also within an inch of the enemy attacker. So basically, you can hit back if you're one on one, but if you double up, there's no swinging back because this guy's too, too busy. And on a fumble, you drop your weapon, so you have to place it next to you and try and pick it back up later. If target attack survives and is not activated, it's still eligible to activate that round. So the, your attack backs are free, basically. They're, they're bonus attacks that don't, don't modify anything. Uh, range attacks are a target of 12. Um, if a model is obscured in any way, you're minus three to hit. You roll a DR12 test, a CV hit, and mark an ammo off your ammo total. And on a success, you roll the weapon's damage. It's worth noting that ammo for like the crossbow was five. You can throw any weapon up to six inches, but you suffer a minus three to your hit, and it's placed in the ground next to your target, regardless if it's a hit or a miss. And ranged weapons count as one-handed makeshift weapons in combat. Damage. If you do a hit, then roll your damage dice and deduct the armor from the result. Armor always reduces damage unless otherwise stated. Or does it reduce the wounded model's HP by the amount remaining? Uh, criticals always cause max damage, and armor is still applied. Uh, leaving combat. Models then ensure in combat. If you wish to leave, you make opponent rolls an agility, d12. If on a pass, the model does not move. 
On a failure, your model moves their movement value and then takes no further actions that turn. If they fumble, they, you can move and take an action. Uh, on a critical, they make an attack against you. Models can freely move off the board edge to uh, leave the scenario. So if someone wanted to run away from the um, Eisenkrish, for example, he'd have to make a DR, a DR12 test at minus four and probably fail. If he fumbles, uh, then yeah, it's you can also take your action afterwards. And if he fails, he just does nothing. But if he succeeds, you don't move. Morale, when a model uh, rolls for morale, take a presence test. On a failure, they flee the flight, immediately moving their max movement towards the nearest board. On the next activation, they can retake the test. On a pass, they act as normal. On a failure, they keep running away. So that's bad for Risen. He's minus one of morale tests. His presence is minus two, so he's minus three to all of his tests. Uh, models must take a morale test when they're critically hit or they strike a downed enemy. Interesting. So if you hit someone who's down, you then make a morale test because you might feel bad about it. When a model's HP is treated as uh, equal or less than zero, it's considered down. They lay it face up. If a down model takes more damage, it's immediately killed. Lay them face down. Down models must pass a death save at the end of the scenario to determine if they died. Um, to save, make a toughness test at DR6. On a failure, you're dead. On a pass, they're wounded and roll on the injury table. On a crit success, they learn something from new and they get to get a new feat. <laughs> Otherwise, you're dead. Spell casting is a presence D12 test. On a fumble, you immediately roll on the calamity table, adding any incurred tragedies to your dice roll and the maximum of 20. Calamity effects last the scenario unless otherwise stated. You cannot cast spells while you're in close combat. So like, for instance, if you fumble your spell casting, I roll a 11 um, and adding any incurred tragedies to your dice result to a maximum of 20. Uh, so in this one, the scroll bursts into flames and is lost forever. But number one, uh, blood spills from your caster's eyes and you're blinded, <laughs> uh, which is an injury result. Uh, on a three, the caster's fingers split open and they gain the bleeding condition. <laughs> uh, on a four, a death bell rings. If the caster is down in the scenario, they are considered dead and do not get a death save. Oh my god. Um, yeah, roll twice and take both results. The calamity table is bad. Spell casting could be terrible. The world is ending. You don't want to cast too many spells. Uh, and then omens. At the start of every scenario, player gets access to the following six omens. They can spend these once and only once per scenario at any time. They're basically feats. They're bonuses that you can do each turn. Uh, you can do max damage with an attack. You can reroll dice once per game. Remove a down model from play, but auto pass your death save. Uh, banality, cancel one critical or fumble. Uh, greed, reroll on the treasure table. Confidence, automatically pass a test like jumping morale or combat. So you get six of these like special plays you can do in each scenario. And then monster rules. So now monsters are on the table whether you're playing solo, cooperatively, or versus, and they will do the following behaviors. So there's some simple monster rules. Uh, behavior, um, so check the monster special rules if they have any. Check to see if the monster's model can see any other models that's not the same type, and monsters can attack other monsters. If it cannot, these monsters are not specified remain still and don't activate. If a monster can see another model that is not the same as itself, it moves 2d6 towards that model. If a monster can see more than a single model at a time, it goes towards the closer one on a tie. Roll to see which one it goes towards. If the monster makes it with an inch, not the same type, um, it immediately attacks. Randomize uh, if there's more than one model within an inch. And then monsters make a uh, all checks on DR12 with no modifiers unless specified. This includes if they are attacked or targeted by spells, and this is also used for any abilities unless otherwise stated. Monsters do not prioritize down models unless otherwise stated. Um, and then monster morale, if it's ever hit by a critical, it makes a morale tech. Roll 2d6. If you roll above its morale, it flees the battlefield, removing 2d6 around until it leaves the field or is killed. And monster morale is with dashing on the morale rolls. Uh, reading a monster entry. So what do you got? How many hit points? What its morale is? Well, what its weapon is? It does damage, so sword d6. And what its armor is? Special rules for a skeleton, for instance. Special one in four skeletons are also armed with bows. Uh, on a one, the skeleton has a bow and ten arrows. Uh, roll d4 on a 1, it's armed with uh, bow and 10 arrows. It will shoot the uh, arrows the closest target can see within 12. And it ignores darkness, because they're skeletons. They don't have eyeballs. They are magically seeing you somehow. A feasting wendigo, 22 hit points. Morale, 9. Uh, d6 claws damage, and then armor, 2. Special, whenever the feasting wendigo down someone, it immediately begins to feast on them for 2 rounds. If it finishes the feast, they'll uh, rise around later as another feasting wendigo. So if it, if it eats you, you come back as another wendigo, which is crazy. A Morka Porka, which is a crazy murder pig. Large wild hogs. Animal cultists. Now, I thought these were cultists with animal heads, but reading more into it, I think it's actually supposed to be the, the animals from South Park. <laughs> from the super happy adventure animals. The whittling creatures that are trying to end the world. Um, 
They can summon other things, which is crazy. Disemboweled Ghouls, uh, special strangles opponent with its intestines. You cannot leave combat with a disemboweled ghoul, so they try and strangle you with your intestines. Uh, Great Maw, which is like a huge eating beast. Uh, 10 hit points, morale 9, it bites for d6 and his armor 3. Um, I love that Ada, which is Kevin's son, or daughter, sorry, um, drew all of this. Uh, and then Cora also drew these ones. So his kids drew a bunch of these, which I think is amazing. And they are super talented. How cool is Ada's, like, crazy great maw? Uh, also, the animal cultists are adorable. The Cork Corpse Collector, 20 hit points, morale. It slams you for d6 and it's armor 3. Uh tries to add your body to its collection. An A-Fang, a Siren, uh, the st Sock Stealing Goblin, uh, a Blood Rage Vampire. I like that it's all credited too. And then random encounters. So evil monsters can show up. At the end of it all, uh, they're those that will pay well for sweet meats. When a monster is killed, a model can take an action to harvest from the monsters. Um, models make a presence test at DR12 on a success they gain an organ and they can sell that for five gold in a scenario. Monster corpses, um, are removed on success. Harvesting organs take up an equipment slot. On a failure, they're disgusted by their actions and must make a morale check. <laughs> oh my god. And then scenarios. There's 12 scenarios, or sorry, 10 scenarios. Um, setting up the table, it's two by two. Train should be re uh, placed to reduce line of sight. Players should each place a single piece of train on the table. After placing train, players roll a d6, adding the number of currently placed train pieces. If it's nine plus, they stop. If not, keep adding train to the table. For example, if you place six pieces of train on a roll of three dice, um, this would add up to nine, and you would stop placing train. Scenarios of dying will be played over six rounds, unless the scenario states otherwise. At the end of the sixth round, your warband gets bored, will be dead, or will flee in terror. Any items left on the table on round six are considered lost, unless um, they're on a model that died or dies as a result of a death save. Uh, and then some scenarios will have a custom round length. If you're playing on larger boards, you might want to increase it. And then read the uh, scenario. First read the ramblings of the Mad Wizard, then your goal, what you're trying to do, your reward. Uh, the wizard's offering you, set up the treasure, uh, the deployment threats, how to play it solo, how to play it co-op, and then the end game. So interestingly, you don't require solo and co-op rules in the core rules. They're, they're boiled into the scenarios, which I really like actually. And then sections marked with the RPG symbol are only for use with the RPG and not to be used in Forbidden Psalm, but the game is designed to be uh, Merc Borg um, compatible. And then all the scenarios. I'm not gonna, I don't wanna spoil them. They're pretty cool actually. So I don't wanna, we're gonna play through them instead. I'm not gonna spoil what they are. Uh, how to play a campaign. So after your scenarios are done, after each encounter, uh, follow these steps. Each warband with at least one standing member gets paid 10 gold for taking part. Uh, roll your death saves. It's a DR6 toughness test. On a failure, you die. Uh, roll for injuries, it's a d8, broken bones, saddened, weak, diseased, maimed, lost limbs, missing eyes, uh, or only a flesh wound. And then uh, number four, you can sell items to the Mad Wizard. He pays half the cost of weapons and armor listed on pages 14 and 15, write it down. Scrolls cannot be sold. Uh, gain and spend XP. Warbands gain one XP per monster killed. Uh, treasure you collected, uh, scenarios with at least one member of the Warband surviving. Uh, model lets you downed, past death saves, and warband members who die. You can spend five XPs to do one of the following. Improve a warband member's ability by one, remove an injury, reroll a warband member's flaw, bring a new feat to a warband member, or bring a single warband member back from the dead, but they return with a new flaw. And then hiring new members to the party. At the end of the world, there's plenty of lost souls looking for work. If your warband has less than five people in it, uh, you, you can recruit new members for free. You create them just like you did the old members, and new members come with no equipment, so either pillage from the dead or buy them something. Um, <laughs> if all the five of your warband members are dead, you start from scratch. And then finally, seven, reallocate equipment, including placing it from your party stash or buy new equipment. Relics, you can find relics of the course of the game um, if they're in this scenario, and you can roll to see what they are. The merchant, instead of selling to Vrickprix, you can sell to the merchant, a shadowy figure who approaches you from um, on your way back to Vrickprix. He buys item for one more gold than Vriprex. Free items cannot be sold. He um, has available to sell three random weapons, one random armor, one random piece of equipment, and one random relic. And you generate them each time you visit. He sells items for one gold less than listed price to a minimum of one gold. Uh, the one relic is sold for 100 gold. However, Brickus does not like the merchant, and when buying or selling, roll a d20 on a one, you're caught, and one of your models gains the lost limb injury. <laughs> If you're caught a second time, because he, he gets off your hands for stealing from him. Vrippix refuses to deal with you until a new member of your warband is sent away. Uh, replace your member with a new one, and the merchant then stops dealing with you. <laughs> 
What are you buying? What are you selling? It's a, uh, that's completely a Resident Evil 4 thing. And then uh, generating your own scenarios. So like a bonus scenario and how to make your own. Uh, and then, yeah, your warband sheets, some um, example models, beautiful miniatures done that 28 style you can see here. Some cutouts that you could use to play if you want to play with those. Uh, how to kit bash a miniature and some great example channels to check out like Sonic Sledgehammer, Miscast, Miniac, uh, Marco Frizzoni, NJM, uh, Pete the Wargamer, Black Magic Craft, Midwinter Minis, and Little Legends Studio. And then your random generation, some thank yous, and that's it, Forbidden Psalm. A game of blood, metal, death, and socks. So I'm pumped to try this out. You'll be able to see this, I think, next week. Uh, yeah, probably next week on Tuesday. I'm going to give it a go today uh, using what I just rolled up. I'll neaten it up and stuff like that and play through the first scenario. So big thanks for watching. Again, you can check this out by clicking the link below um, and grabbing a copy and supporting Kevin for writing these cool rules. And hopefully we'll see some more stuff for Forbidden Psalms soon. Uh, so there's my latest GMG review. Uh, until then, I'm Ash. Okay. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you uh, want to support the channel, of course, like and subscribe and hit the little bell below so you get notifications when I post future content. I do post stuff seven days a week. Uh, if you want to support the channel um, further, you can, of course, buy a t-shirt through Spreadshirts, um, buy a measuring gauge or objective markers from Desperate Designs. Um, or, of course, most importantly, there is Patreon. Patreon is what makes all this possible. Uh, keeps the lights on, pays for the studio costs, pays for the equipment, model costs, and everything else. And most importantly, um, puts food in my kids' bellies and a roof over their heads. Uh, big thanks to everyone past, future who supported me. Uh, I do this stuff because of you guys, and of course, I will continue doing it as long as I can.